In the name of the risen Lord, amen. Sometimes it seems like there are debates, discussions where the weakest argument keeps coming up again and again. Like, if I just go to bed now, I'll wake up feeling so refreshed that I'll be really excited to clean up the dinner dishes in the morning. <laughs> or this is one I've heard for a long time. You know, I've noticed that there's a lot of traffic on 29 North. I think we should just build a few more lanes. Nobody's ever tried that. It'll definitely solve the problem. Depending on my mood, I can be amused, annoyed, or heartbroken when I run into, for the millionth time, the suggestion that the internal inconsistencies of the Christian scriptures are the fatal flaw in the enterprise of Christian faith. There are stronger arguments against Christian faith and practice. We're not here to discuss them today. That one always comes around. It is propelled by a culture that has decided, contrary to many centuries worth of Christian wisdom and experience and practice, that the infinite riches of our scriptures, the magnificent anthology of the soulful writings of the ancient faithful that we call the Bible is suspect at best, if not thoroughly discredited, by the revelation that it doesn't read like a watertight legal brief or a peer-reviewed article in a scientific journal. I have yet to hear anybody make the case that because the writings inside Alderman Library disagree with one another, the library is really pretty worthless. And it's one of the great ironies of our time that so many secularists and self-proclaimed atheists have apparently accepted with a pure, simple, unquestioning faith that the Bible is supposed to be not the divine fountain of sustenance that Christians have known it to be for many centuries, but this other thing that certain people who were really upset and freaked out about the scientific revolution started saying it was a couple hundred years ago. So when I am confronted with the breathless breaking news that the Bible contradicts itself, often from someone who knows it more by reputation than by actual acquaintance, I might add, I want to say, I know, I've read it. <laughs> and so had the ancients who compiled it. If they had wanted to bequeath one gospel to us, they could have done that. But in their faith and wisdom, they gave us four, each one exquisitely representing the faith of its particular writer, its particular community. So quickly, I, I promise I'm not going to preach on all four Gospels, but very quickly, I want to identify what is uniquely wonderful, what is uniquely challenging about the resurrection account that we heard this morning from Matthew's Gospel. Two weeks ago, I was at JPJ. I'm sure many of you were there as well to hear Brian Stevenson. And he spoke uh, at the Scoper Lecture about Jesus' ministry as a ministry of proximity. And he talked about the importance of proximity in his own vocation, the importance of proximity uh, in, in, his own, in his own life and faith. And he urged us to seek out proximity. And he described Jesus' proximity to the poor, the outcast, the widow, the orphan. So I want to look at these resurrection gospels and notice who's proximate to what. Who's there and what happens in each of the four stories. So I promised it was going to be quick. Mark's gospel. The women go to the tomb early in the morning. Along the way, they say, who's going to roll the stone away for us? And because we can't do it, we're too weak. It's a giant stone. They get there. The stone has already been moved. And there's a young man in a white robe inside the tomb. Luke's gospel. 
The women go to the tomb early in the morning. They've brought spices for a proper burial because the burial had happened hurriedly. They get there. The stone has already been moved. And now suddenly there are two men in dazzling white clothes inside the tomb. John's gospel. Mary Magdalene comes. The stone has already been moved. She runs to get Simon Peter and the other disciple. But wait, plot twist. She doesn't go to announce the resurrection. She goes to tell them someone has stolen the body. They come running. They see the empty tomb. They run off again. Mary is still there. And at this point, John's gospel looks at Luke's gospel and it says, I will see your two angels and raise you one savior. She looks in the tomb. There's two angels in there in white. She turns around and there's Jesus himself. <laughs> and she mistakes him for the help. She thinks he's the gardener. Those are the three. And then we get Matthew, which we heard this morning. The women go to, go to see the tomb. It doesn't say they intend to open it. It says they go to see it. An angel appears in their presence and rolls the stone away. The angel is not rolling the stone away to let Jesus out. The angel rolls the stone away and Jesus isn't there. So here's the thing about Matthew. The guards also witness this. Wait, who? Guards? Why are there guards there? This is only in Matthew. The guards are there to present, to prevent a resurrection hoax. So if we back up a little bit from what we heard this morning, the authorities say to Pilate, sir, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples are going to go and steal the body away, and they're going to claim that, that there was a resurrection. The Pilate says, good thinking, you have soldiers, you have a guard, seal that thing up and leave guards there until at least the third day. And that's what they do. So the guards are there because they remember the authorities, the enemies of Jesus, remembered this promise of resurrection. The disciples weren't listening, forgot, didn't quite believe it, weren't sure what to make of it. They're not there. They're not standing at the, to at the tomb eagerly anticipating resurrection. But the enemies of Jesus remember this promise. And they go to make sure nobody pulls off, pulls off this hoax. So the women are proximate to the tomb. And so are the guards who are working for the enemies of Jesus. Now, if you've ever been to church on Easter Sunday, you may have been, depending on where you were on Good Friday, either scolded or congratulated about being in church on Good Friday. Because there's this line that gets repeated that says, you know, in order to really appreciate Easter, you've got to go stand at the cross. You've got to go to the darkest story. Otherwise, you don't really understand resurrection if you haven't encountered the cross. And so you really should have been here on Friday. I don't think it's necessary to go to church on Good Friday in order to encounter the cross. We have all brought it with us, each of us in its own way. We have brought fear. We have brought sorrow. We have brought grief. We have brought illness. As Haley preached from this pulpit on Good Friday, we live in a world of crucifixion, whether we look at it or look away from it. So we're all proximate to the cross. What happens to those who are proximate to the tomb? Because we often forget, even when we're here on Good Friday, that when we come back on Easter Sunday, we're not just proximate to flowers, we are proximate to the tomb. So what happens for those, those who were there? Well, the guards go. Here's what the guards do. They were there to make sure that, that nobody tries to pull this funny stuff about resurrection. So they go back to the city. They tell the authorities everything that happened. They were there. They saw the angel in Matthew's telling. They saw the angel roll the stone away. They've been standing there day and night. It was sealed up. 
there's no Jesus. This is a problem. They go back and tell the authorities, uh, you're not going to believe this. Here's what happened. We were there. The authorities say to them, here is a big pile of money. And what I want you to do is if anybody asks, you tell them that the disciples came in the middle of the night and stole the body. These are the enemies of Jesus who were scared of a rumor of resurrection. What are they going to do with an actual resurrection? So they took the money and they did as they were directed. The guards who were sent to the tomb to prevent the resurrection hoax are now perpetrating the death hoax, telling the thing that they know is not true. They're terrified because resurrection is terrifying. It's going to upset their world. Well, guess what? The women who are there and witness this are also scared. They left with fear and great joy. So Matthew seems to want to tell us that, yes, we live in a world of crucifixion. We all knew that. Matthew wants to tell us we live in a world of resurrection and you can look at it or you can look away from it. Resurrection in Matthew's telling is not about who has witnessed it. It's not a matter of, well, it makes sense for them to believe it. They saw it. The guards saw exactly what the women saw. They are all proximate to the empty tomb. So the question for us is when we encounter resurrection, what will we do about it? What tombs are we guarding? What promises has God made that we, like the disciples, didn't hear, didn't want to hear, didn't listen to, didn't know what to make of, didn't believe? What promises has God made that we, like the authorities and the guards, are hoping against hope God will not keep? Where do we find ourselves so afraid of the wonders that God might do that we will do anything, even debase ourselves to stay faithful to the power of death? And when the angel rolls the stone away in that moment of stun, being stunned, that moment of fight or flight, hearts racing, joy and fear, which will we embrace? Will we perpetuate the hoax about the power of death, or will we tell the truth about resurrection? Amen.